Uh, so in writing this paper, I found myself time traveling, which is a concept that I like to use often when I present papers. So I, I looked at um, material um, that I'd written in the recent past and other papers um, that I'd written since 2016 to really understand the distance traveled. I also asked myself, what was the central question I was trying to answer um, in of a, the Stuart Hall Library? questions of empire often kind of popping up within these papers that I've written. And it was less of an unanswerable question and more of my attempting to set out um, a paradoxical set of positions deliberately geared to enact some sort of change, uh, whether that was in within me or beyond me. My practice as a curator has been to position myself in parallel to um, a cast of actors. Sometimes they are people, sometimes they are places, um, and sometimes they are memories or ghosts. Whatever role they play, they act as catalysts for a creative surge, which is sometimes um, initially indecipherable. That is, but I don't know where it's going to end, but the surge is always collaborative in that there must be an interplay between all or one of those elements um, to really feel like a transformation has taken place. For me, libraries have always occupied that space between people, places and the ghost of a memory. I just didn't visit an art gallery, gallery, never mind a museum until I was about 17, but the public library was my second home as a child growing up in East London. Located almost at the end of the road where I lived, I spent evenings, weekends and summer holidays in my local library. I learned to play chess, I learned to love um, books and without a doubt I experienced indescribable joy uh, in, the, in my local library. I was free from the world of my parents and like any small child I was lost in my own orbit crafted by the space of the library which was definitely more than a home for books. Um, I would say that I nurtured this passion silently until I became director and chief curator at Innova in 2015. In fact it was the Stuart Hall Library that drew me back to Innova. I'd started my career there as uh, an assistant curator in the 1990s and left some six years later to work freelance. And similarly, I would say it was the library in the reading room at Welcome Collection that was the icing on the cake that really whetted my appetite for becoming a museum director. However, the context could not be more different. On one hand, the Stuart Hall Library lay at the nexus of cultural activism, embedded within its fabric, a questioning of how knowledge and power is, is generated and dedicated to decentering received ideas of empire. And on the other, Welcome Collection, being the embodiment of patriarchy by Henry Welcome and his desire to collect the world through the prism of the Museum of Man. Because of this disparity, some of what you will hear today um, is episodic um, in part and part oxymoronic, as I posit a few thoughts on how libraries can be at the centre of creativity, innovation and flux, whilst attempting paradoxically to bring about lasting change. I'm going to go back in time and talk about some of the, the work that was done at Innova to centre the library as something more organic to the creative process, as well as something more malleable in terms of a space where knowledge and therefore power is generated. So episode one, Innova, all that is solid melts into air. So Innova was founded against a backdrop of changes in the UK in the 90s and as a response to an irrefutably changing world. After a concerted campaign by black artists for greater representation in the mainstream visual arts, the organisation was established in 1994. The organisation grew out of a proposition by the Arts Council in a significant report released at the end of 1991. And that report was, respond, was responding to a demand for a new kind of institution which might enhance the public enjoyment of and engagement with the work of artists of African and Asian descent. 
It was specific in suggesting how such an institution could develop a critical debate about the nature of modern art and actively support a new international dialogue. This new institution would aim to show a broader spectrum of contemporary visual arts practice than was currently available in Britain. Innova grew up in the era of multiculturalism through Britain's shifting political landscape from the new Labour agenda of the new millennium to the present to the present Tory programme of austerity and cuts. In parallel, policy-driven art imperatives begun as early as 1976 to the Cultural Diversity Action Plan um, to where we find ourselves uh, in recent years um, within the Arts Council's Creative Case for Diversity, um, which attempted to move away from a, um, a legal framework to an ethically artistic and holistic one, and actually thinking about that in terms of where we are now with um, the Arts Council investment principles around inclusivity and relevance. There's been a, some significant change in how this question of the importance of diversity and inclusion has been situated within the arts funding landscape. So a defining moment um, and an earlier reckoning for heritage spaces was the 99 conference called Whose Heritage? The Impact of Cultural Diversity on Britain's Living Heritage. This event, which brought together arts and heritage services, and as you, many of you probably know, was aimed at measuring the impact of cultural diversity on, Brit on Britain's living heritage, was uh, developed uh, in response to a particular kind of cultural and political background. So one was the growing awareness of the unsatisfactory track record of institutions as a whole in reflecting the diverse nature of society. The challenge of the McPherson report into the Stephen Lawrence murder, which later led to amendments of the Race Relations Act. The growing strength of the movement within the African, Caribbean uh, and Asian communities to document and see documentation of their presence and their contribution in galleries, museums and archives in an attempt to recover hidden histories. And finally, understanding the increasingly shifting nature of concepts such as identity and national heritage and a need to revisit them in the light of shifts in society. So the opening of the conference, Labour's government, uh, Culture Secretary, Secretary at that time, Chris Smith, admitted to the selective nature of history and then called for a more complete version of the truth. It now seems antithetical and posit positively radical given the current government rhetoric around the precarity of contested heritage. In an almost heartbreakingly prescient commentary, Smith outlined how whole sections of the community were forced to look elsewhere for reflections of their existence and contribution, and this was not acceptable in an inclusive society. He said that cultural institutions and funding bodies needed to put in place strategies to enable everyone to understand and appreciate their own cultural heritage and to experience those of other people. So remember, this is 1999, not 2019. Professor Stuart Hall, the sociologist and cultural theorist and in the first founding chair, in his, his keynote spe speech at the conference, suggested that the debate had moved on from notions of included and excluded. He marked, and I quote, an unsettling subversion of the foundational ground on which the process of heritage construction was until very recently proceeded. We see it reflected in different ways, in how the text supporting artworks and framing of exhibits are written by museums, in the attempts to make explicit the perspective which has governed the selection and the interpretive contextualization, so as to make it more open to challenge and reinterpret in exposing and the exposing of underlying assumptions of value, meaning and connection as part of a more dialogic relationship between the cultural institutions and their audiences. And in the tentative efforts to involve the subjects themselves in exhibiting processes which objectifies them. He states, these are only some of the manifest signs of a deep slow motion revolution in progress in the practices of cultural representation. 
the journalist, Mayor Jaggi, in the final keynote speech, proposed that this new environment, in turn, provided even more challenges. The determinedly Eurocentric view of society's gatekeepers, i.e. many of the museums and galleries in attendance, still erase perspectives of schools of artists and other creative voices repeatedly and thus, inv thus invalidating whole cultures. She urged that the heritage we construct should not simply be a question of inclusion, but of perspective and participation. In 2019, the public historian David Olasoga gave a, gave a keynote at the Who's Heritage Symposium, an anniversary event to reflect on Stuart Hall's project to challenge the inequalities in the culture and heritage field. Olasoga remarked upon the deep, slow revolution, which had in fact gathered pace, but was still decidedly glacial with its poor statistics on levels of engagement and participation and inclusion with black and brown people within cultural institutions, whether they be audience members or member of staff occupying senior positions. Episode two, the Stuart Hall Library. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I took up the position of Director of Innova in late 2015. And at that time, I encountered a TED talk by the writer Chimamanda Adichie, um, which some of you probably know. She warns of the danger of a single story, a story which flattens the experience and presents stereotypes which don't complete the picture of the world. This idea of the single story became my reference point when I started thinking about what Innova and the Stuart Hall Library had been in the past and what it could be in the future. In developing a new vision for Innova, I understood that the incipient Innova could not or should not be dis disentangled from the Innova established in 1994, working as an agency or gallery without walls. Part of that new vision necessarily contain the vastly expanded Stuart Hall Library, which is a significant specialist arts collection focusing on the work of artists of African and Asian descent. It anchors Innova to a physical and intellectual space, giving much context to its work uh, and programme of, of arts activity. The work of the library drove an ambition to build a greater body of knowledge around each of the artists, scholars and practitioners with whom Innova worked. It was a key plank in ensuring the legacy of their practices for future generations of researchers and audiences. Placing the library at the centre of the artistic programme has meant that this space, which acts both as a repository and a producer of knowledge, more than just underpinned our work, it moved from subject to object. Part of this revisioning was precipitated by the artist Ting Ting Cheng, who was the first artist in residence in the Stuart Hall Library, and that happened in collaboration with the Stuart Hall Foundation. There have been previous interventions in the library in the past, which explored the relationship between text and narrative in conjunction with the visual and revealed the depth of the library beyond the idea of it solely as a repository for books, manuscripts and journals. Shane's work, however, demanded more of the library, asking it to yield and become more pliable and reveal even more of its depths. You'll see that the beginning of this slide shows some of the images from um, that, the work, the installation, and actually it was a kind of walking tour that Shane did. Um, uh, the slides obviously don't do it justice in terms of describing the experience. Cheng was born in Taipei, and after her BA, uh, she moved to London in the late 2000s. Her proposal for On the Desert Island was submitted through an open call for the residency. And its starting point was Professor Stuart Hall's interview on BBC uh, Radio 4 Desert Island Disc, and it was in 2000. The work was presented in the library as an interactive audio site specific piece that provided a unique way to, to explore a unique collection that uses a, that uses a categorization system to place exhibition catalogues according to their geographic location rather than 
the traditional system of order. Made in 2017, On the Desert Island imagines the library as a group of islands with its bookshelves and contents as landmass to be negotiated. The artist's narrated tour intertwined with clips of Hall's interview encouraged the listener to wander between Great Britain and Jamaica and its former colonies as if they were part of an archipelago. On this physical journey, the listener also follows Hall's conversation about identity and diversity over 20 years ago, heard in the context of pre-Brexit, post-referendum Britain. Revisiting Professor Hall's commentary, On the Desert Island casts a curious light on the political and social cultural realities where issues of sovereignty, so sovereignty and the rise of uncontained xenophobia was, were as prophetic as he imagined. Professor Hall comments, Britain is facing two possibilities as alternative futures. I want the British to consciously move towards a more cosmopolitan idea of themselves. What is less discernible about the work and also a significant part of its appeal is the parallel narrative of Cheng's own arrival in this country and her experience as a migrant, as one who came to stay, as one who had to negotiate what it means to be different from what or diverse from whom. Cheng writes in a blog about the work, I'll be coming to terms with that, what happened during the past 17 years. It's always a turning point. We can always turn like we always have been. There is no answer here. Probably there is no answer at all. It's just a thought, perhaps a journey, a journey that you're already participating in. The work was made over a period of three months uh, where Cheng came into the library every day. Um, and at that moment uh, when she was making the work, one could nervously look over your shoulder and think, wonder if you could um, hold back time because of what had taken place in 2016. The Brexit referendum strangely coincided with the arrival of the Black Lives Matter movement to the UK. And it drew connections with those in cultural spaces, those working in cultural spaces, demanding change to structural barriers not yet publicly called out as institutional racism. Depending on your, view, your viewpoint, several crises were converging or redemption had finally come to make people feel heard and valued. When I think back to the moment of Cheng's work, situated as it was in this pro Brexit moment, alongside the trauma of the Grenfell Tower fire, I could not imagine a world now viewed from the territory of the UK, so mired, so stilted, so flawed by the collective global trauma elicited, elicited by the pandemic. Layered upon that, the multiple social movements such as Black Lives Matter that decried the murder and abuse of black and brown people at the hands of states of various countries across the world. More profoundly, the deep slow motion revolution that Stuart Hall observed in 1999 is desperately trying to take on a more urgent momentum of its own fuels as it is by those who work in and around cultural institutions calling out for change now, understanding that racism and ableism is all grounded in power and control. And I'm glad for this challenge because whether we like it or not, we are gatekeepers and guardians of a certain type of heritage, knowledge, pedagogies, and therefore we have the responsibility to really consider who's thought of, particularly when we enter loaded spaces which hold special collections, what grounds or limits our thinking and our knowledge. The current discourse, particularly around decolonization, has brought into sharp focus the need to start rethinking the most basic assumptions. We think our spaces of information openly share that information by partnering with communities who in themselves are knowledge keepers and experts in the field. The concept of decolonization requires a constant critiquing to avoid the danger of being unmoored from its original political intent and ultimately misused. Whilst it can be put into play to undo colonial legacies, it has 
waywardly become defined as a contemporary ex expression, precariously used in the place of diversity and vice versa, which has its own set of intractable problems. Franz Fanon's de uh, definition of decolonization from 1963 states, decolonization as we know it is a historical process. That is to say, it cannot be understood. It cannot become intelligible nor clear to itself, except in the exact measure that we can discern the movements which give it historical form and content. Historically, a research library in the service of those in art or cultural education are designed around the individual use researcher rather than a community. Assumptions are made about what constitutes culture and what is of interest to history. At Innova, I was told time and time again by young British, Black and Asian artists that their cultural references were often not viewed or recognised as valid within their art education experience. The material in the Stuart Hall Library and Archive provides some restitution to those glaring omissions and narrow definitions of practice. How can libraries play a role in disavowing those rigid pedagogies of the past, which try to tell us that the way things, that things have always been a particular way or history in all its glorious impartiality could never undermine lived experience. Libraries and archives are bound to adhere to international standards and principles designed to make the world of knowledge supposedly more easily accessible. However, sometimes these standards perpetuate a mistruth that libraries and archives, like museums, are neutral spaces when in fact they are, they represent cur curated partisan spaces. I am told by colleagues more knowledgeable than me that this is because librarians and cataloguers are are to a degree expected to use their own subjectivity to define the subject of a resource in our knowledge management systems. These individual biases can reaffirm the European view of knowledge when we continue to use cataloging standards defined and set by the Library of Con Congress. So as part of ongoing work at Innova, the librarians started to challenge the categories of searching for information in the Stuart Hall Library catalog and workshops exploring the impact of language in determining and shaping the knowledge that we acquire. It was found that the Library of Congress subject he headings are problematic for representing the specific collections in the Stuart Hall Library. And that was because some of the subject categories are, are inherited from an accepted imperial and colonial attitude, especially when describing topics of race, gender, sexuality. As a result of the challenges presented by the Library of Congress headings, librarians at Innova have since started to devise its own subject thesaurus based on terminology used by authors and artists to describe their work to stand alongside Library of Congress subject he headings. As a microcosm of what some libraries already do and do very well, it was important to understand that collections development and reader development feeds into each other the Net Research Network programme at Innova selected through an open call builds a network for sharing with groups of individuals, collectives and institutions that was reflective of the organisational ethos and resources that they collected. In addition, academic seminars reappraising and recentering important bodies of work by artists and scholars felt like a necessary objective for the library seeking to reimagine itself as a recuperative space serving a wider community than an academic one. Episode three, welcome collection and unfinished conversation. At the point of joining Welcome Collection in October 2019, unbeknownst to us, we were on the point of receiving archive service accreditation. The question that excited me the most during those various presentations was, what does it mean to be a 21st library? And who is a 21st century researcher? My experience at Innova told me that the library had to turn itself inside out, become more porous, more malleable, mean more to more people who probably didn't even think of themselves as researchers, but who without a doubt 
would find some version of themselves inscribed in the narratives contained in the library. If our mission and our central concern at Welcome Collection is to challenge how we all think and feel about health by connecting science, medicine, life and art, then part of that must be enabling greater access to our material, allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, to be uncertain in order to truly allow new types of being and thinking around health to emerge. We're doing many things that I feel incredibly proud of as an institution cognizant of its own flaws and failings, much of which was mapped out almost a year ago in our anti-blackness and racism statement. I believe we're manifesting some pretty radical interventions to transform us into the organisation we want to be and have the potential to be in moments of crisis as much as fulfilment. These include the social justice curriculum, a peer-to-peer -peer whole organisation development programme led by an inclusion, our inclusion practitioners, the transcription project led by a collections information team, working side by side with colleagues in digital engagement. And we're currently embarking on inquiry to understand what direction we can go in to define the research library of the 21st century. This is led by our library experience and engagement team, and it's a nascent project called Library Futures, but one I know will be central in achieving our mission. At present, some, some parameters are being set and it is an internally focused piece of work, but it is, it is already prodding at the membrane of the institution by asking who can help us in this quest? Who can we learn from? What do we have to do deliberately with care and purpose, which will require a massive shift in mindset? Our visitor experience assistants are demanding with persuasive authority that we begin to dismantle the imperial legacy literally carved into the fabric of our space, most convincingly played out in the history of the reading room freeze. It feels particularly important to think of our libraries now can act as recuperative spaces for solace and care that move beyond the idea of a service provision and more into the space uh, of the imaginary, where barriers real and imagined can be broken down. As an institution, we must also ask what, where we can really capitalise on our differences, a space whose collection is dispersed throughout the museum, such as in the reading room. That will also help to provide us with an opportunity to bring, rethink access to our collections, as we also redefine the idea of a permanent collection gallery with the, with re the repurposing in 2022 of Medicine Man. The potential of the library in the reading room to provoke us into action and consider the kind of turn Chang mentioned in her own migrant journey and simply ask who is the com community we serve, for what purpose and for why. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Melanie. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, just uh, as we wait for, for colleagues to, to uh, compose their questions, I wonder if I could, if you could say more about what you see as the essential ingredients for a 21st century library. Well, yeah, I think we're, there's a there's a few people, quite a few people at Welcome Collection putting their minds to it. But I suppose based on past experience, um, it's to do with who we who we imagine it to be in the library in the future. And I think a lot of the work that we're doing now is thinking about who we want to to engage with, what kind of invitation we're crafting in terms of. Uh, being a space where um, disabled people, black and brown people can kind of see themselves rather than see themselves apart from. And I think it's important to think about who we're doing that in collaboration with. Um, I think scholars, thinkers, creative practitioners, artists are really vital for that process and to see that process as a collaborative one rather than seeing it as the one which is kind of handing over the burden of responsibility to um, those collaborators to kind of help us uh, break down some of those barriers. Um, there's also a question of who, we, uh, who we're having conversations with when we're developing collections, uh, understanding what 
um, who the users are, who the new users are, and who we want to, um, and yeah, who we're asking in terms of uh, what they want to see and what the kinds of experiences they want to have in that space. I think we definitely need to be um, in listening and acting mode at the same time. Related to that, I wonder how you see the, you, your, your talk was a lot about, you know, how the library plays an active role in research rather than just being a repository of, of, of knowledge. How do you see your work in the Wellcome Collection um, influencing the Wellcome's own research activities? Um, well, I, I guess um, uh, Wellcome's research activities. Yes. 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 Welcome, trust. Um, yeah. Welcome, trust. Well, uh, uh, there's well, there's just I think there are there, there are set, there are lots of opportunities. I think just because we're kind of in the midst of developing uh, the new research programs, yeah. uh, which look at these kind of key challenges. I think we already speak quite significantly to some of that work that's doing, but I think we have to focus now as we kind of approach uh, the development of our own strategy to talk about actually how we kind of amplify some of those uh, those challenge areas. And I think we'll begin to do this through um, some of the sort of new areas of work uh, that, that are emerging, particularly around the new collections gallery um, and within our kind of temporary exhibitions program um, and through, I guess, some of the, the work that we're doing on our, through our kind of digital editorial and the kind of literally the stories that we're enabling people to talk about, which make those connections between the, the, the challenge areas. Um, I think what we're going to, what we will be doing more of, or what we would like to do more of is think about um, how we, we support PhD researchers, particularly in that area between where the humanities, I guess, meets um, scientific research and discovery research. Um, we already do some of that now, but I think in our, in the work that we're doing around um, making the collections more accessible, we'll probably be able to kind of invite a, not just PhD researchers, but a whole range of researchers to help us to understand how, how our collections help us to directly kind of amplify some of those uh, the challenge areas not some of them but all of them thank you we've had a, a couple of questions come in um first one's from neil grindley you quoted fanon as saying that decolonization cannot come about by friendly understanding and from the from our perspective in 2021 when we read in the press about culture wars in the uk and elsewhere between what uh what for shorthand i'll call the woke and the unwoke does this mean that memory organisations must take sides and be militant? That's a brilliant question. <laughs> um, hmm. It's a kind of I, the taking. I think you can be militant without <laughs> taking sides. Um, I guess that for me, there seems to be a, there's a bit of a, 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 a paradox there. Um, I think there's, and also I think there's something deeper at play when we think about memory organisations, uh, which are kind of, which is probably, you know, I might be stating the obvious, but whose memories are we preserving? Whose memories are we taking care of? Um, and in uh, a sort of militant position might be to kind of really interrogate, um, to interrogate that. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you're taking sides. It probably means you're probably presenting a more complete picture of the world and representing and reflecting a more, more diverse cross-section of society. Militancy doesn't necessarily need to be a sort of a politic about political opposition or even be party party political, um, but I do. I, you know, might be speaking to the wrong person in that regard because I do see myself as being quite quite strident because what I witness is a whole uh, part of society 
who feel that they they're not welcome into certain into certain museum spaces who you know and through research that we've done um at, at well collection know that they that they want to kind of engage with culture so this isn't about um some sort of uh um sort of evangelical um mood to kind of say you know they must engage with culture it's it's a given so i suppose i've answered your question in a number of ways uh it's both a, a yes and no answer mate and sometimes they're set those two those two things are separate thank you um i mean you 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 spoke a bit there at the end about engagement. We had a question from David Prosser. Are there different strategies when thinking about widening engagement to the physical space compared to widening engagement to the digital space? Another great question. Thank you, David. Um, Questions of um, uh, questions of access are are really are, are really key for us at the moment. Um, and the one of the things we're thinking about is actually how the the, the physical and the digital might become more um, responsive of each other. I guess when we think about how. Uh, audiences engage with our collections without sort of stating the obvious there is a kind of there is a need to think about physical spaces differently um, and how we use interpretation when we're thinking about uh, being more creating a more inclusive environments but we also need to think about language and whether that language, that interpretation is experienced in a physical space or a digital space, uh, we have to think about the encounter with those words. There's, there's a definitely a symmetry between how we think about the language we use and that's a kind of, it's a massive project that we're engaging with in the moment around inclusive language. Um, uh, but also thinking about the, the experience, which isn't, um, which is a kind of a really significant piece of what we have to do, which isn't that just, to, which isn't um, just thinking about the, what, the written word or the physical space or the audio. I think it's how um, there's a lot for us to think about in terms of making ourselves more accessible particularly for, for visitors who are disabled. But I think there are some of the considerations who are, some of the considerations are the same, but some of them are distinct dependent, dependent upon the space of the encounter. Thank you. A uh, question from Masu Koka. Speaking from a lived experience, my in-laws are from a small town which is overwhelmingly South Asian. Many of them have never experienced a large library or museum, and many don't see the value unless they experience it in a way that is meaningful to them. I wonder if Melanie can give her view on how we can enable such audiences to experience these collections and exhibitions in a way that invigorates them to have sustained engagement. Thanks, Mr. Um, uh... That is, that's a massive question. Um, I get, you know, I, I do always go back to my, uh, my, I suppose, my, my own experience. Um, and uh, there's something about the proximity you know, I suppose like, you know, I grew up in the 70s, 1970s, and there was something about the proximity, the physical proximity to, to libraries that I was fortunate to have. And um, not everyone has that. So I suppose there are a number of things that can happen to enable that to, to be the case, which is actually going to the space where people are. Um, and not always be, you know, technologies can be seen as this um, panacea, I guess, to kind of enable people to kind of have access. And whereas that's not always possible, 
so there is this kind of space between the physical and the digital that we have to think, how do people encounter the material that we hold in the library? I'm not, I'm not sure how that's done. Um, I see for a sort of, and this might be me sort of sidestepping the question a little bit, Masood, but I see Britain as this kind of microcosm um, of the world. And actually we shouldn't be, when we think about the conversations that we're having, yes, we can think in a global scale, but the global, the sort of trans, the global can be represented in the translocal. And actually how do we engage with communities on our doorstep? And I don't mean literally within London, but within the UK for whom we know that the, the material that we hold in our collections can speak profoundly to their life experiences. Um, and we have to find a way to, to engage with those communities, you know, to think in a kind of more mobilized way of how those engagements occur. I, I am always a little bit stuck between the possibilities of kind of digital engagement through the internet and the possible of physical engagement because there are kind of limits to both. And I'm not sure what that space is in between. And I know that there are people out there thinking this through and have really great ideas around it, but it is a, it's a real, um, uh, yeah, it's a real conundrum. Thank you. Um, I had a question from Jess Gardner at the University of Cambridge Library. The Welcome Collection is local, national and international. How are the library's practices adapting to engage in meaningful ways, enabling exchange and change uh, online with communities unable to come in person? Um, it's something that we have really had to think hard about in the last year. I suppose we were one of the few research libraries that had to close. Um, uh, for a large part of um, uh, 2020 um, and early 2021. And we've had to think about how we can provide, um, so, I suppose, service to, to, to people who would, who would have come into the library otherwise. So we've, I suppose we've used very kind of um, traditional ways of, uh, of and of allowing us to kind of meet the needs of, of um, visitors to the collection. But one of the things which we've been doing as part of the research around Library Futures is to understand what other organizations have been doing in that time and how they've been, kind of, how they've been maintaining relationships with the communities that they served. One thing that we have really noticed actually um, is a kind of uptake I don't know if that's the right word, in, in the accessing of our collections internationally during, um, uh, during periods of, of lockdown. Um, we probably have to do a bit more analysis on how we kind of build those relationships, but we have seen that as a kind of positive outcome um, of the last year, but we're still thinking about uh, how we can do more of that work, but also thinking about it, not just within the space of the library per se, the physical space of the library, but across a range of different activities that we do, which um, mean that our collections can be more, more accessible. Um, we did uh, a number of things during lockdown, which looked at the ways in which we engaged with our communities. So not specifically, around the library, um, but looked, I suppose, holistically at uh, particular areas of work across our different departments. So we did something called the Common Challenge, which was to really uh, look at this central question of what it meant to be human now. Um, and in the process of that, uh, produced a podcast, um, commissioned new work, collected um, new work, co-commissioned, uh, new work and that was a way of us I guess um, enabling uh, a sort of continued conversation about the kinds of things we were trying to do to achieve our mission. Thank you. I uh, had a comment from Cliff Van Dort at, at, uh, at the, the head of the National Archives Library saying he'd like to talk to you more about the journey that you are on and where you want to be because it's the path he'd like to take. Um, 
Paolo Marchioni from JISC, is there always a risk of representing incomplete or partial experiences through collection management and interpretation activities because they will always be mediated by individual, more or less conscious subjectivities? Short answer is yes. <laughs> um, uh, it would be, uh, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question, I guess. Uh, I, uh, what, I think what we're trying to achieve is a more complete picture. It's not saying that we have all the pieces of the jigsaw and it will make this really coherent, cogent picture of what the world looks like um uh there will there will look there will be gaps and there will be ruptures this is this um the work that we're doing is trying to kind of move this site the idea of the museum on from this sort of uh sort of you know cathedral of knowledge and power to one which is actually about uh helping individuals to kind of to I suppose to understand their place in the world that sounds a bit idealistic doesn't it um uh, I certainly know that I found that experience through um being in museum and libraries and if our coordinates of that space are always the coordinates that we've inherited from the sort of 18th and 19th century and even the 20th century then we have to plot new coordinates and it's this kind of new map will not be like the old map and therefore there will be gaps and there will be fissures and um I personally I find that I find that exciting I don't yes I don't think the intention is to kind of build this complete picture another you know that might be me sidestepping again um uh and uh this is why I guess um it feels like a lifetime's work. It feels like the work will, will never be done, but we have to be, and it's such a good question because I think we have to be cog cognizant of the fact that uh, there, will all, there will always be some sort of gap, particularly as we speak from this very um, demarca de de sort of demarcation area of the, of, the, of the UK or the British Isles. Thank you. Um, question from Claire Blamey. Um, can you expand a bit more about what you mean by inclusive language? So, um, again, another good question. <laughs> I wish a colleague was here to, um, to, to help me with this. I guess on a very, um, uh, on a very sort of fundamental level, it's thinking about the kinds of language, words, uh, phrases that have been used previously, which have been offensive. So you can kind of go on to our library catalog now, probably other library catalogs now, and look at the way that kind of the objects have been catalogued from another time that we use derogatory language which will undermine the power of that object to tell the story about the community from which it came from. So part of the work that we have to do, and this is happening through the transcription project, is really to, to, to re-articulate what, what that object is by using carefully considered language. And that's just one way we're doing it. There are a number of things that we're doing when we think about inclusive language. We've just, um, we written a statement about Henry Welcome on our website, uh, and it's a it's a it's a a big team effort across a number of different departments. We already do it, I guess, through uh, the the what, what's happening on our, our website through digital editorial. But this is a kind of bigger, um, more, um, I guess, more far-reaching project to really kind of, uh, if we're going to kind of achieve our, our mission around equity, diversity, inclusion, we have to kind of have this interrogation of the language that's been used historically. Thank you. And a, a 
fairly long question from Rachel Minnett. Um, there are issues in the structures we have in place for cataloging narratives and subjects that are problematic and create problems for contemporary inclusive practice. Thinking here about the example you gave on the Library of Congress catalogues. However, aside from these limited and problematic framing, there is also the issue of absences where elements of person's identity, such as race, ethnicity, and gender, are not recorded uh, as, um, uh, as assumptions are based on the dominant cultures present. What are your feelings about systematic recording of protected characteristics to give researchers with deeper frames of reference and to make visible those narratives that are minimized through these assumptions? Do you think there is a danger in this practice of objectifying subjects and anchoring their narrative uh, slash research value to their identities? Uh, thanks for your question, Rachel. Um, I, the, yeah, it's a, yeah, diff another difficult question. Um, it can't just be that we're looking at uh, the kind of physical characteristics of a person's identity. That is the kind of limitations, I guess, of doing some, of being positioned now and casting ourselves back into the past. If we don't have enough information to make a decision around uh, an individual, that, that is, that you're absolutely right, there is a danger there. And we, we already have that, I guess, in, in different parts of, um, certainly different parts of what's publicly presented um, in Welcome Collection and perhaps what's kind of more hidden within our, our catalogue. Um, I think there are kind of examples of, uh, uh, of organisations that are uh, attempting to do it well. Um, there is, um, and I can't remember the name, but there was an amazing exhibition, um, I think the year before last, um, around the representation of black people in, in, in art. And actually one of the things that they attempted to do was understand the person in the painting through a kind of forensic exploration to kind of delve in to multiple histories to, to, um, to do that work. And this is, I suppose, something in, slightly something in reverse or in parallel to what you were talking about, um, Rachel. But we're kind of starting from a position where, where, where individuals are presented or written about and we know nothing about them. And therefore they, they take on this kind of stereotypical of, of um, uh, framing or a kind of caricature. But actually there might be something that needs to be done to really hone down on an individual's role. It's something that David Olasoga, Olasoga talks about um, a lot as well. I think we have to recognise the risks around doing that, but also but also think about what we might gain from from doing that work. There has to be some balance. I don't think we can't. I don't think we can't not do the work. Um, but those risks are really important to highlight. Thank you. And and what I think is going to be probably the final question from uh, Sean Woodward. As we think about developing 21st century libraries, archives and collections, do we need to develop different and new metrics to demonstrate uh, our value to both funders and users, particularly as we look at multiple modes of access and use? Can you repeat the question, Liam? Yeah. What was the main as thrust? We, it was about developing new metrics for funders. Do we need, do we need different ways of, of demonstrating our value? I pause on this because I always, I, I, I sort of, I sort of struggle with this idea. I obviously, Innova was a publicly funded organization. We were always having to kind of demonstrate our impact. And similarly at Welcome Collection, we have to do that. We have to do that too. Um, and I, I suppose part of me is, 
I, I struggle with this because I suppose, again, I kind of see the intrinsic value of, of libraries uh, and reading rooms. Um, uh, so I'm, but I think there is a kind of vast body of research um, uh, and increasingly so, which talks about the kind of value of um, public libraries, of collections open to the public um, that make kind of distinct impact on the life of, uh, of individuals and um, developing new metrics um, might probably be the wrong person to, to ask that question. Um, I don't think we have to go too far to demonstrate our impact though. That might be quite a naive response. And obviously uh, I'm talking from a place of somebody who has, is utterly converted um, uh, I don't think we have to go too far to kind of to, to, to make a point about the impact that we have.